What is my purpose? What are you looking for? We are inescapably creatures of desire. So many of us, we're, we're living life, but we're not alive. We're, we're, we're going through it, but there's nothing that gets you out of bed in the morning. You're wandering, figuring out, why am I here? Whoever you think has given you your purpose, whatever you think gives you purpose, will be the thing that shapes your priorities. We need to consider the possibility that sometimes we're looking for the wrong thing. We are trying to figure out why am I here? And the thing is, life doesn't stop for you to figure it out. Embracing the purpose of God, it always requires a change. Some of us are aborting God's mission in our lives because it's uncomfortable. So you're gonna bail? Are you just gonna give up on the whole mission? Or do you want to get well? Good morning, church family. We've learned in 1 Peter that our hope is alive because Jesus is alive. And that's the great theme of that song. Um, a great theme in 1 Peter has been hope. And our hope is alive today because Christ has risen from the dead. Join me in prayer as we get started today. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that we can sing praises to you. Thank you that you loved us while we were yet sinners. Thank you for your word. I pray today as we go through this text, Lord, that you'll speak to us through your spirit and your word. That we'll be challenged to live a life that's pleasing to you. A challenge that is worthy of the great grace that you've called us to. Pray for your wisdom and discretion as I preach and pray that you'll open our eyes to hear wonderful things from your word. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 22 through chapter 2, 3 today. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 22. Praise the Lord that we had a baptism today. Josh, thank you. And Liam. First Peter 1, 22 through chapter 2, verse 3. Can we stand firm in the grace of God alone? Can we stand firm in the midst of suffering, in the midst of opposition to the faith, in isolation? Can, can, can we be Lone Ranger Christians and endure the, the trials and the various trials that we encounter as believers apart from the body of Christ? Well, today in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, we're going to learn that even in adversity, especially in adversity... We have a responsibility to one another that requires our fellowship with one another. It requires that we walk together in the midst of trials as a body of Christ. And that responsibility that we have toward one another is that we love one another. We're responsible to love one another as believers. Read 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 through 2, 3 with me. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy, and all slander. 
like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Last week in chapter 1, verses 13 through 21, Kevin powerfully highlighted that our duty to the Lord is to live a holy life. Our duty to the Lord is to live a holy life. This week, the focus is on our duty to one another. And our duty to one another is that we love one another. And I believe we need to be reminded to love one another. Because the reality is, loving one another as believers doesn't always come easy. It's not always a natural thing for us. So throughout Scripture, we're commanded to love one another. Listen to Wearsby on this matter. He says, one of the painful facts of life is that the people of God do not always get along with each other. You would think that those who walk in hope and holiness would be able to walk in harmony. But that is not always true. And walking in holiness, walking in hope, doesn't mean that we naturally walk in harmony and love for one another. Therefore, we have to make a daily decision to love one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And my purpose today as we dive into this text is to answer three questions about this command to love one another. First, I want to answer how. How are we to love one another? If you're taking notes, that would be the model for loving one another. Second, I'd like to answer, to answer why. Why are we to love one another? That's our motivation. Third, I'd like to answer, how do we apply this? What are specific applications that we can do today to apply this passage? This will be the application of loving one another. So first, let's jump right in with the model for loving one another. How are we to love one another as believers in Christ? That's the focus of verse 22. And this, this verse focuses specifically on the character of the love that we're to have for one another. So how are we to love one another? First, we're to love one another purely. We're to love one another purely. Look at verse 22 with me again. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. When we obeyed the truth of the gospel, God purified and cleansed our hearts. Our hearts have been purified by Christ's blood. Acts 15, 9. Sinners' hearts are cleansed by faith. But also, in the, in the context of this book, we're called to daily walk in purity. We're called to daily purify our hearts. In, in, in the sense of our salvation, our hearts are cleansed, purified once for all. But in our daily practical lives, we're called to walk in purity. And notice what Peter does in these verses. He couples the call to love one another, our text today, with the call to live holy and the call to live pure and godly lives before the Lord. Biblical love cannot be divorced from a biblical morality. Walking in impurity and walking in love go hand in hand. That's the context of 1 Peter 1.22. So we have to let go of society's notion that says that if we're going to be loving, if we're going to attract the masses, anything goes morally. That's not biblical love. The contrast is that biblical lo love flows from holiness and purity and is characterized by fidelity, but fidelity to the Lord. So we love one another purely. Our love, the character of our love must be pure. And that's only a, possible through the gospel. We can't cleanse ourselves apart from Jesus Christ cleansing us through his blood. And once he cleanses us through his blood, we can walk in that purity by the power of the Spirit. Next, we're to love one another sincerely. Verse 22, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Sincere love is love without hypocrisy. The word sincere actually means inexperienced in the art of acting. Sincere love is a genuine love. 
Um, sincere love doesn't put on an act in front of the church and then run fellow believers down behind closed doors. Sincere, genuine love doesn't look out for what it's going to get, but rather what it can give. We're to love one another sincerely. We're to love one another fervently. Keep reading in verse 22. Fervently love one another from the heart. The word in this text for fervent is an athletic term. And it means striving with all one's energy. We have several of our members today that are, that are playing hooky because they're running in a triathlon. And, and I was visiting with one of them last night and they were telling me of all the work and all the training they're having to do to, to run in this triathlon. And they were getting up at four this morning to, to go. And there was all this discipline, all this effort, all this work that has gone in to their endeavor. And that's the same word for fervent here. That's the way we're to love one another as believers. Fervently. Without ceasing. Never relaxing in our efforts. Loving one another takes effort. It takes time. Remember, this letter was written to those who were undergoing various trials. And often as we walk through trials, our capacity, think about this, when you're going through a hard time, your capacity to love others is often tested. And Peter here writes to believers that were enduring difficulty, reminding them to love one another. Going through trials doesn't exempt us from the command to love one another. We, we keep on loving one another. We need to love one another, especially in the trials we encounter. We're to love one another fervently. How quick is the world to give up on loving people? That must not be a characteristic of the body of Christ. We're to love without ceasing. We're to be committed to one another. Next, we're to love one another from the heart. Verse 22 Love one another fervently from the heart. The word for love in this phrase is agape. It's unconditional love. We are to love one another unconditionally from the heart. In scripture, our, our kids learned this at camp this year. In scripture, the heart is the control center of the body. It's the center of the will, the intellect, and the personality. To love from the heart is a decision that we make. It's an act of the will. The call in Scripture to love one another isn't a call to drum up some emotion or feeling. Rather, it is a call to obedience and to obey Scripture. This is in contrast to the spirit of the age which tells us love is a feeling that comes and goes. The Bible declares in contrast that love is a command to be obeyed, not a feeling to find. And we, we need to be reminded of this as believers. As we walk through life together. Because if you attend this church, and I've said this before, long enough. If you get to know me long enough, you're going to be let down. We're going to let one another down. Therefore, we're called to keep on loving each other. We're to love one another unconditionally from the heart. It's a matter of the will. Now, when we do love one another unconditionally from the heart, does it produce emotions? Yes. Does it produce feelings? Yes. Does it produce joy? Yes. But let's not buy into society's notion that it's just a feeling that we chase. No, it's a decision to make. It's a command to be obeyed. Love one another. I think of the times I've, I've talked to people that are going through marital difficulties, and one of the most common things I hear is I just don't feel in love anymore. I don't feel like I felt 20 years ago. Well, none of us feel like we felt 20 years ago. It's not a matter of how you feel. It's a matter of the commitment you made to love as a matter of the will. We're called to love fervently from the heart. That's the model for loving one another. How do we love? Purely, fervently, sincerely from the heart. Now, what is the motivation? Why? Why should we love that way? The motivation for loving one another, according to verse 23 to 25, is the new birth. Read verse 23 with me again. For 
When you see the word for in Scripture, he's explaining why. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. Being born again in this verse, or the new birth, is what takes place at salvation. When a lost sinner believes the gospel and looks to Christ alone for forgiveness, what's the gospel? The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ came to save sinners like you and me through Christ's work alone. And when a lost sinner believes the gospel, Scripture says they're made alive. They're born again. The great need of humanity is to be made alive because we are all born dead in sin. How many of you had to learn how to sin? No, it comes naturally because we're born into sin. And our great need is to be born again into life. And because of the fall, all humanity needs to be born again. And God in His great mercy, 1 Peter 1.3, has caused us to be born again through Christ. By what Christ has accomplished. And those who believe in Christ, who hear the word of truth and believe, are made alive. Liam has been made alive because he believed the gospel. Never to die again. That's the power of the new birth. And the new birth, according to this text, is one of the great motivations for loving one another. The new birth is one of the great motivations for loving one another. Specifically, the reality that we're born again through God's word. Look how this text describes God's word in verses 23 to 25. God's word is imperishable. You've been born through not seed that is perishable, but imperishable. It's incorruptible. It's living through the living word. God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's enduring. It's the enduring word of God. It lasts forever. In verses 24 to 25, give an Old Testament account of the enduring nature of God's word. Read those verses with me. Here Peter is describing how God's word lasts forever. For all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. This summer we've all seen that grass withers quickly, haven't we? I, I had hopes at the beginning of the summer that my yard would stay green maybe until August. And those hopes faded in June when, when 100 degree days continually hit us. And the grass faded quickly. It looks, my yard now looks like it's January. But this passage says that is actually what happens to all flesh. That's what happens to all humanity. All humanity eventually fades away. And in the context of eternity, we fade away rather quickly. But the good news of the gospel, the good news of, of God's grace is that his word endures forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word endures forever. And because God's word endures forever, those who have been born of God's word also endure forever. That's our great hope. We've been born of incorruptible seed. Therefore, the basis of our unity and love for one another is that we've been born again by the grace of God into a, a family that won't die. Just as we have natural love for our natural family. There's even a greater love that we have for the body of Christ. And I can say that my parents are here because my parents are believers and they know what I'm talking about. There's a great love for the body of Christ that comes as a part of being members of his family. And of the incorruptible, imperishable family. And that's the basis of our unity. And that should motivate us to love one another. We're all members of a family that's not going to die. I hope you love one another because you're going to be together forever. Right? We're, we're members of a, of a forever family. Incorruptible because we've been born of the enduring, never-ending word of God. Listen to Charles Spurgeon bring this together. See that you love one another because of your noble birth. 
being born of incorruptible seed, because of your pedigree, being descended from God, the creator of all things, and because of your immortal destiny, for you shall never pass away, though the glory of flesh shall die, and even its very existence shall cease. I think it would be well, my brethren, if in a spirit of humility, you and I recognize the free dignity of our regenerated nature and lived up to it. We live up to our regenerated nature by loving one another unconditionally from the heart. And this points to an overarching theme in First Peter and in all of Scripture. And it's this, that we obey God, we love God, we walk in holiness in response to His great mercy, not in order to receive His great mercy. The motivation for loving others is not that we loved God first, but that He loved us first. Listen to 1 John 4, 10 and 11. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God loved us by causing us to be born again. And that love He demonstrated for us and to us should motivate us to love one another the same way that He loved us. So that's the motivation. The new birth. Your identity in Christ should motivate you to love other believers. Now what's the application? What are specific things we can do to practice biblical love? Well, verses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 give two primary actions. Number one, we're to lay aside unloving, destructive behaviors. And number two, we're to long for the pure milk of God's word. First, let's look at some behaviors we're to lay aside if we're to walk in love. Therefore, putting aside, we're in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, putting aside all malice. That phrase, put aside, it means to rid yourselves of. It, it means to take off. Yesterday, a few of the boys and I got under our house. And we had to do some pier and beam work under our house. And we got very dirty. We literally had dirt coming out of our ears. And there was dirt everywhere. And I was hungry, so I went in, was going from outside to inside the kitchen to get some food. And I was covered with dirt from head to toe bad dirt like it was it was gross and Laura was standing between me and her kitchen and um she kind of gave me the look and I looked at her and I said these clothes can't can't come into your 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 kitchen can they and she said I'd rather them not and um so so that what she was telling me is there's there's certain clothes there's certain things that don't belong in that kitchen there's certain things that I had to lay aside if I was going to come in there and fellowship and have bacon and eggs, right? There are certain things that had to be laid aside. So it is with the Christian life. If we're to walk in love, there are certain clothes we just have to take off. There are certain things we just have to lay aside because they have no place in the Christian life. First, what do we lay aside? We lay aside malice. Malice is wicked ill will. Malice is hostility. Malice is what builds up when we dwell on what someone did to us. When we choose to keep thinking about it and replaying it in our mind over and over and over and over again, we start having malice and hostility toward those people. And if you're a child of God, by the power of His Spirit in you, Scripture calls you to take those clothes off. Lay that aside. Next, we're to lay aside deceit. Notice in the text, it says, lay aside all malice. Lay aside all deceit. We're not to keep a little malice just in case. Right? We're, we're to lay it all aside. What is deceit? Deceit is deliberate dishonesty. Deceit is willfully tricking someone. Unbelievers are called to cast off white lies and stretching the truth. How easy is that to do? Or to lay it aside. It's unloving to lie to others. No looking at your neighbor, guys. <laughs> lay, 
we're to lay aside next hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is pretended piety. It's duplicity of character. Um, if sincere, sincerity is not being skilled in the art of acting, hypocrisy is being skilled in the art of acting. The hypocrite can put on a great show at work or at church and put on a totally different show at home. We're called a love without hypocrisy. We're to lay aside being duplicitous. Amen. Are we as loving at home to our wives and children as we are to our friends at church or at work or at the gym? We're to lay aside envy. Envy is resentful. I feel like I'm reading from a dictionary today. I know there are a lot of terms in this text. There's a lot to define. But as we define these terms and understand what they meant in the original biblical meaning, it, it, there's so much application for our lives. And we just need to walk through them together. We're to lay aside envy. En envy is resentful discontent. Envy and jealousy can easily creep into our lives. Our culture places such value on material, worldly, and physical success that we can begin to envy others before we even realize it. And here Peter urges believers to lay that envy aside. We can't sincerely and unconditionally love those that we're jealous of. We can't love those that we resent because they got something that we didn't. What's the cure for envy? The cure for envy is trusting that the Lord is big enough to bless others and you. And just because someone else gets something doesn't mean the Lord's not going to provide for your needs. The cure for envy is finding your satisfaction in the Lord alone. And looking to Him in His Word. Not worldly success, not physical success, not material success. Finding in the Lord who is good. We're to lay aside slander. We're to lay aside slander. Slander is backbiting lies. Slander is evil speech against someone. We slander when we misrepresent someone's character to another. An example of slandering is assuming that we know someone's intentions and then gossiping about what we believe those intentions to be. Oh, he does this just because... He wanted to do that, right? That's slander. Gossip is most of the time slander. Scripture calls us, if we're going to walk in love and love one another from the heart, to lay these behaviors aside. One writer said that these are not the grosser vices of paganism, but community-destroying vices that are often tolerated by the modern church. We must not accept these behaviors as normal in the body of Christ. How can we do that? It's easy to get up here and this was a very convicting passage to study. How do we lay aside such behaviors? It's not an easy task. Number one, realize they're going to come. Realize that envy, malice, slander... And all those things may come and tempt us. We live in these bodies of flesh. And if these vices automatically went away at conversion, there would be no need for all the commands in Scripture telling us to lay them aside. So let today be a warning. Let today um, spark your senses to be aware that these things may creep into your life. And when they come into your life... Later on in 1 Peter, he's going to tell us to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. There is a war that goes on in the mind of and hearts of believers. That, that lets you know you're a believer. And as the, the, the war wages on, abstain from those things. When sin comes crouching at the door and you have those sinful thoughts of malice and hostility and envy and all those things, confess them as sin to the Lord. Because when we confess our sins to the Lord, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So many times in our sin, our temptation is to run from the Lord. 
Because we think somehow if we run, he's not going to know. But he does. So we should run to the Lord because with him is mercy. With him is forgiveness. He's ready to forgive. And with the Lord is cleansing. So confess your sins to the Lord, asking him to cleanse you from those things. We're going to celebrate communion at the end of this sermon. And one of the things I encourage you to do as we celebrate communion is have a time of silence and confession of sin. This passage is a convicting passage. And, and you can confess those sins to the Lord knowing that he will forgive. There's another way to lay these aside and love others properly, and that's by longing for God's word, by craving God's word. Look at chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. He's wrapping this up. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Peter closes this passage with a call for believers to long for the pure milk of God's word. Just as a newborn baby craves milk, so believers are to crave the word of God. In contrast to the impure attitudes mentioned in verse 1, the word of God is pure. And as we take in God's word, it purifies us from unloving behaviors. It strengthens us to love one another. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. So crave God's word. Long for God's word. How can we increase our craving and longing for the very word of God? How can we do so? Number one, realize that consuming God's word for a believer is not optional. It's necessary. We have to take into God's word. When Noah was born some 19 years ago, I learned a lesson about babies craving milk. I had been working nights and Laura had been up with the bait with Noah for like a month or something, maybe three weeks, he was a newborn. And I came home one night from working at UPS and told Laura, I've got the baby tonight. You go back and sleep in the room, and I'll sleep on the couch, and we can put Noah in his little bouncy thing, and, and I'll wake up with him when he cries. You just fix me up a bottle, and we'll be good to go, honey. You go rest. And she said, okay. She said, but what I'm going to do because I know you don't wake up very easy, Matthew. I'm going to put the, the crib right next to your face. So like I was laying on the couch and he was in his crib and his face was here and here was my face. And she said, that away, you'll hear him when he cries. I said, okay, that's great. This is, I'm going to be a good husband and do this. Well, I fell asleep and the next thing I remember was Laura standing over me saying, do you not hear him screaming? And, and, and I looked over and Noah was just, screaming in my face as loud as he could. And it had evidently been going on for a while. And what I wanted to tell her was, well, I kind of thought I heard him a little while ago, but I thought he'd go back to sleep because that's really, I was a new dad. I thought, oh, he's crying. He'll, he'll change his mind and, and want to eat in the morning at like eight. But I was wrong because what I thought is that for a newborn baby, drinking milk was optional, but it wasn't optional. He wasn't going to shut up until he got that bottle. And I learned that night that milk for babies is not an option. And the same is true of God's word for believers. It's not optional and we think it is. We think it's optional to take in God's word as believers. But look what the text goes on to say. Crave the milk of the word. Why? So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. There will be no spiritual growth with a closed Bible. There will be no spiritual growth solely relying on the writings of other Christians. You need to get in God's word for yourself. Read the word. What does Jesus say in John 15, 5? If you abide in me and my words in you, you do what? You bear much fruit. 
So I encourage you today to open up the Bible. And if you don't know where to start, say, I haven't read the Bible. Read John. Read Proverbs. Whatever day of the month it is, pick that chapter in Proverbs to read. Pick up the Word and read it. And God's Word doesn't return void. It accomplishes His purposes. So I encourage you to develop an appetite for the Word of God by feeding on the Word of God. He closes this by saying, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. So I encourage you today to, to dive into the Word. What does God's Word have to do with loving one another? It feels like we just had two different sermons. One about God's Word and one about loving one another. What does the Word have to do with loving one another? Well, ab abiding in God's Word, pouring God's Word into our mind, is one of the key ways that we walk by the Spirit. And as we walk by the Spirit, the Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And what's the fruit of the Spirit? What's the first one? It's love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And as we walk in God's Word, His Word, um, to borrow a term from 90s counseling, it, it fills our love bank, right? The, the God's Word fills our love bank because it is written by the God who is love. So we should pour His Word into our minds, relying on His Spirit. So as we've had this sermon today that in my, in my own life, a very convicting sermon, if you realize you're not loving believers the way you're supposed to love them, the immediate application for you, it, number one, is ask, have I been born again? Because until you're born again, you're not going to love people the way God calls you to love them. Number two... Get in God's Word. I don't want to oversimplify it. But God's Word is powerful. Walk with the Lord. Abide in Christ. And you'll bear much fruit. We're going to close the sermon. And then Mike's going to come and lead us in communion. So I encourage you right now to prepare your hearts for communion as we enter a time of worship. I'll close in prayer. And then Mike will come up. Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that you are good and just and righteous, yet you forgive sinners like us. We don't want to get over that fact, Father. You're a God of all grace that loves us where we are, so help us to love others where they are. Pray for the rest of our day together that it will be a time that honors and glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.